So shock. Shock is a life-threatening circulatory disorder and is characterized by poor blood perfusion. Okay. And when you have poor blood perfusion, your tissue is all around your body, you're not getting oxygen, so that they have hypoxia. And if you wait too long, and this is even minutes for things like the brain, you can get death. So again, this is very important, this is very scary stuff. And the most common findings you're going to see in the patients are going to be hyper hypotension, so low blood pressure, because there's poor blood perfusion, and you're going to have tachycardia. So the tachycardia comes about, remember the baroreceptor re reflex, it's going to sense that low blood pressure, it's going to cause the, um, it's going to decrease parasympathetic firing, and you're going to get your heart, it's going to contract more, it's going to, it's going to beat faster, so that's how you get ta tachycardia. Now there's many different etiologies of shock, um, and we're going to go through all of them. And we're going to look at their etiologies, their cardiac output, and we're going to look at systemic vascular resistance and coronary capillary wedge pressure. Now there's a couple things I want to talk about first. So systemic vascular resistance is how vasoconstricted you are. And I like to think about it as warm versus cold, okay? Because remember, vasoconstriction constriction or dilation will determine whether your body feels warm or cold. So that means if you're warm, you're vasodilated. dilated. If you're cold, you're vasoconstricted. constricted. Okay. So whether you're warm, your body feels warm, or whether your body feels cold, that's going to reflect the body's systemic vascular resistance. The other thing to talk about is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Remember, we discussed this before. Remember what this reflects? This reflects the left atrial pressure. And I like to think about it as whether you're wet versus dry. Okay? If you're wet, that means you're, vascular, you're congested. You have vascular congestion. That means you have a lot of volume in your system. If you're dry, that means you have not very much volume. Okay? That means you're not vascularly congested. I like to think about it in terms of these. It's just more intuitive this way. It makes more sense in real life. Okay, so let's get into it now with that being defined. So hypovolemic shock, what does that mean? That means your blood volume is down. And what can cause your blood volume to be down? Well, if you're, if you're hemorrhage, hemorrhaging all your blood, if you have blood loss, that can cause decreased blood volume. If you're dehydrated, that causes blood volume decrease. Because remember... Um, a lot of that blood volume is from fluid that you intake. And finally, burns can cause hypovolemic shock. Because remember, we have our, our vessels, and when you burn, when you have a burn patient, they're going to have increased permeability. So f all that fluid is going to leave the vessels. So you're going to have poor um, blood, blood perfusion in the vessels themselves because all the, all the blood has left, all that fluid has left. So what's going to happen to cardiac output? If you have low volume, then your cardiac output is going to go down. And that just makes intuitive sense to me. If it doesn't, just remember that Starling curve. Remember that low volume means you're going to have low end diastolic volume. So you're going to have low, low length, low stretch of the ventricle. So that's going to have poor contractility. That's the whole Starling mechanism. Now we're going to go to the SVR and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And I want you to think about it. Is it warm or cold? Is this patient warm or cold? Well, if not pumping blood into the vessels, then they're not going to be very. They're going to be pretty cold. Remember, the blood in the in this vessels of the skin is what's going to keep you warm. So they're going to be cold, and they're going to be vasoconstricted because they're trying to um, maintain their pressure as much as possible. And what about their volume status? Are they going to be wet or dry? They're going to be dry. It's just duh, that's the whole definition of hypovolemic shock. They're too dry. So what do you do? You give them fluids. You give them tons of IV fluids. You're like going to massively perfuse them with IV fluids to try to maintain that volume, try to, try to increase that volume. So next is cardiogenic shock. So this is shock or poor blood perfusion due to the problems of the heart. So it's cardiogenic. Now what problems can, of the heart can cause this? Well, we talked about two of them already. One of them is the acute myocardial infarction. So part of the heart wall dies, so it's not contracting well. And the other one was heart failure. So the heart failure is basically the heart's not pumping well. So then that's how you get poor, for, poor forward flow and you get cardiogenic shock. The other two etiologies we haven't talked about include valvular disease. So problems with the heart valves preventing heart, um, blood from flowing out of the heart. And an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia causes this because an arrhythmia causes poor synchronized heart contractions. So it's not synchronized, so blood's not flowing well out of the heart.
So it's, what's going to happen to cardiac output? Well, if your heart's not pumping well, then obviously that's cardiac output goes down. It goes down a lot. And what about um, SVR and PC, PC um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Well, are they going to be warm or cold? Again, if your heart's not pumping blood out well, then there's not going to be blood in the system, vessels, so they're going to be cold, and then thus they're going to be basal constricted. And then are they going to be wet or dry? Remember, in cardiogenic shock, you're going to have vascular congestion, and we talked about that. I talked about in, in heart failure, the blood backs up, so you get vascular congestion. So they're actually going to be wet. They're going to be, uh, you're going to see that jugular venous distension. You're going to see peripheral edema. So they're going to be cold and wet. The treatment here for cardiogenic shock, so you're going to give them inotropes to increase that contractility. Remember, that's the problem. You're not have, you have poor cardi cardiac contractility. Give them inotropes to increase that cardiac output. Once you've done that, your blood pressure hopefully will, will go back up a little bit. Then you can vasodilate them, um, and that's going to reduce the afterload. So that's going to reduce the pressure that the heart has to pump against. But remember, you can't do it until the blood pressure has improved because the vasodilators themselves decrease blood pressure. So next is obstructive shock. This is the same idea as cardiogenic shock, except for it's not the problem of the heart. It's something around the heart, such as your lungs, that is going to prevent the heart from pumping well. So this can include a cardiac tamponade, so it's fluid around the heart that's preventing um, diastolic filling of the right ventricle, because this is basically you have an uh, encasing of the heart with fluid, so it can't expand. You're going to have a tension pneumothorax that, again, it impairs right ventricular filling by impairing venous return to the, to the heart. And you have a pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism will have, and will, if you have a large one, you can greatly increase the afterload to the right ventricle. And again, that's going to cause problems with the right level of the heart from filling. So again, it's physiologically the same as cardiogenic shock. Um, the heart doesn't fill well, so then the cardiac output, again, is the same as decreased cardiac output. And then what's going to happen with SVR and piece of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Again, it's physiologically the same, so you're going to be cold and wet. So the treatment here is you've got to treat the underlying cause. You've got to get rid of that tamponade, that pneumothorax, that, um, and then that's going to allow the heart to fill, fill more normally. Finally, we have distributive shock. What is distributive shock? It basically means that the vessels are super dilated, so the blood is distributed, it's extrally distributed so you have a certain amount of blood and if you increase the volume that can be distributed in that's going to decrease the blood perfusion and decrease the blood pressure what can cause your vessels to super dilate there's three different causes one is sepsis so infection will cause dilation of your vessels two is anaphylaxis that's the allergic reaction and finally cns injury central nervous system injury and how does that happen well, central nervous system, how does that control your, vaso, um, your vessel constriction and dilation? Remember, it's through the sympathetic output. So if you, lose that, um, if you get CNS injury, you're going to lose that sympathetic output. And then so you're going to get super vasodilation. So what's going to happen to cardiac output? So this one's a little tricky. In sepsis, what's going to happen is your cardiac output is going to go up. Because you're vasodilated, so afterload goes down. And your heart's trying to beat extra to maintain that perfusion. So cardiac output goes up. The tricky part here is that in anaphylaxis and CNS nerve injury, cardiac output goes down. Why does that happen? Well, if you look at CNS nerve injury, remember we just said sympathetic innervation is lost. And sympathetic innervation also controls the heart. And that's what uh, it controls heart rate. So if you lose that sympathetic innervation, heart rate goes down, cardiac output goes down. And what happens in anaphylaxis is that you get systemic vasodilation, including vasodilation of the coronary arteries. So you get coronary hypoperfusion. That means your heart is not getting enough blood. So if your heart's not getting blood, it's not going to beat well. It's, it's going to be hypoxic. It's not going to beat well. So that's how you get poor cardiac output in anaphylaxis. I just want you to note that in first aid, they, they say the opposite. They say anaphylaxis increases cardiac, out, cardiac output, but I think that's incorrect. Finally, is this patient going to be warm or cold? Basically, are they vasodilated or vasoconstricted? Well, we just talked about it. We said they're going to be super vasodilated. So they're going to be warm. They're going to be wet or dry. Are they, va are they vascularly congested? No, they're not vascularly congested. Um, so they're going to be warm and dry. 
And the treatment here is you gotta, again, you gotta maintain pressure, so you gotta give him fluids, you gotta hit him, hit him with pressors. Pressors will cause vasoconstriction, which is the whole problem here. So you hit him with norepinephrine, and anaphylaxis, what you wanna do is you hit him with epinephrine. And epinephrine is just that, epi, remember that EpiPen, that's what you do. You need the EpiPen for, EpiPen for anaphylaxis. All right, so that's for that's uh that's it for shock. I just want to emphasize that you don't have to memorize this chart. You really just have to understand. You have to understand how how each of these etiologies here will affect w what kind of shock it's going to cause. You have to understand that um, acute myocardial infarction will cause a cardiogenic shock. Um, sepsis causes a distributive shock. Okay, to understand each of these uh, etiologies, and then after that you can intuit the cardiac output in SVR. You don't have to memorize this, okay? Don't memorize this. Treatment, you do kind of have to memorize, but it kind of coincides with the underlying etiology. So I hope you can understand this and you don't have to memorize this and you'll be doing very well. All right, so that's it. I just want to emphasize that you don't have to memorize anything. You just need to understand how each etiology will cause poor blood blood perfusion. Does it cause poor blood perfusion because there's low volume? That's hypovolemic shock. Does it cause bl poor blood perfusion because the heart's not pumping well? That's cardiogenic shock. Or is it because there's something preventing the heart from, uh, from pumping? Something that's obstructing the heart, that's obstructive shock. Or is it something that's causing the blood to be distributed very, very diffusely? Is it because the, 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 your vessels are super dilated, so they're, they're, um, there's low blood, perf the low blood pressure and low blood perfusion because of um, distributive shock. So y you can understand all of these, but if you understand each of these etiologies, you'll understand which shock it is it is causing, and then you can understand the cardiac how the cardiac output, systemic vascular resistance, and pulmonary capillary blood pressure will be like in each of these etiologies. So you don't have to memorize this. So really, the only thing you kind of have to memorize is treatment. Okay, and that's pretty much that. Actually, is very intuitive as well. It just goes back to the under, underlying etiology. Um, so I just want you to understand that. Understand this slide. Don't try not to memorize um, many things. You'll be good.